Since the last 16 years, I've mentored over hundreds of students through my Argentum mentoring program and have analyzed over, you know, more than 700 cases now and taught students to experience practitioners on the template behind case taking and analysis to prescribe highly accurate prescriptions and follow-up management until the final resolution. So one of the most common questions from students in my Argentum survey is overwhelm. I mean, they wonder what will practice be like, a typical practice. I mean, what's coming my way in, in new patients, in new practice, what kind of cases I will see, and you know, how do you give results that are more noticeable to clients? So today I want to actually share a case study of a recent case submitted by my student practitioner from the UK on my Argentum mentoring portal to demonstrate one type of classical case, right? That you will see in your contemporary practice and how to approach and take a case for providing the best prescription using the stages template at stage three. Right? And I'm going to talk about a classical strategy of constitutional prescribing and the three key bits of information you should get to ensure you have a complete case at that stage. All right, so let's get started. Okay, so this is the case. It's a case of intense panic disorder. And it was submitted by my student in my Argent mentoring program. So he's from UK and um, he had this lady come to him, a female, 52 years old. She is a slim lady with long brown hair, tied up in a ponytail. Um, you know, so he's given a good description of how the patient presents because it's very vital for us to know and observe a patient. So she's wearing loose clothes, flowery leggings, and she's see, she seems quite desperate to resolve the situation. Um, and she's very open, expresses a lot with her hands. She's very talkative. A lot of this information is useful for finding the right stage of the patient, plus their susceptibility, the potency, a lot of important details in these observations. So she comes with this intense anxiety. Now this lady has been on antidepressants for about 25 years and she has been off those medications um, for just a few months. Um, but she's also been on hormone replacement therapy since she's gone to menopause and now she wants to get off those medications as well. So she's getting a lot of withdrawal symptoms. She's not coping off the antidepressants. That's the time she comes to my student here. She says, if I get very stressed or something upsets me, I get triggered. It's like a light switch goes. I end up feeling really horrid this whole sensation in my body that I can't cope. I have strange and intense sensations in the body. I feel very heavy, oppressed, and this buzzing feeling in my entire body. So what's happened is this patient has come with a written history. Um, you know, most of my students send a questionnaire, which is really helpful to fill up the gaps between the in, inside the consultation. So this is what she's written in her patient form. She says, I can't cope or deal with the easiest task. It's too overwhelming. I cannot take in any new information. And if there is conflict, I'm absolutely unable to cope. I get a buildup of overwhelm. If there is a thought or something somebody says to me, I'm very, very overwhelmed. I break down. I cry a lot. So she's very easily offended and she's very sensitive to what people say. And she says, I shut down. I I'm, I'm feel paralyzed. I find it very difficult to talk. Every day, or most days, she wakes up with this horrible sinking, heavy, tight chest sensation. There is this fuzziness and heaviness throughout the body. She's not motivated. There's no confidence. She's losing hope now. She feels she's not getting anywhere. And she's also getting these severe crampings in the lower abdomen. So a lot of information she's repeating, but she's very vivid and the very clear sensations that she's describing here. She's very sensitive. She's all these things come up with those small questions on a sensitivity to noise and food. And then she says, any noise that goes right through me, I'm very indecisive in a food shop. Or if I'm texting a message, I, you know, I'm very indecisive what to write no interest in things or I don't feel like doing anything. 
I'm obsessed with healthy food, but I feel the cold intensely. So, so many symptoms all over the place um, coming from everywhere. So she talks a bit about her childhood in the forms and she says, I was very anxious as a child. I wouldn't leave my mom's side. I was very shy. I was a follower. I wanted to fit in and be accepted. My sister was very outgoing. I wanted to be like my sister. So I started sneaking out at night. She rebelled when she was 12. And that was when she had her first sexual experience. But she says I was taken advantage of. So she went off the rails at school and she says I was an angel before that. Then she writes about her teenage history. She says I started taking drugs as a teenager. I moved to London because she rebelled and left home early. And she says I had bad experiences. I was pressurized to take drugs. I didn't want to, but she had to because she wanted to fit in. She had severe perineum on ecstasy, cocaine, marijuana. She also tried heroin, but she completely lost the plot. She couldn't even stay in the car for a few minutes. She would have to get out. It was all crazy stuff. So then comes the information at when she was a teenager and a young adult between the age 19 and 25. Her first partner she had at 15 and her experience was of being abused and manipulated. She dumped her in the middle of the night before her driving test and so she was a wreck and failed. She said, I was a yes person. He was a strong character. I was not. He was a drug addict. And she froze whenever she was with him. He would just come in, take things from the house, sell them off for drugs. And she said, I was completely numb. I was paralyzed. I couldn't speak, couldn't move out. Could, you know, I was breaking down. But she couldn't leave him. And then she says, he is the father of my son. So she got pregnant and she stopped all those drinking and drugs. And, and then during her pregnancy, when she was just about to give birth, about two weeks before that, she had a fire in her flat and everything was burned out. And that was for her like a godsend because it got her out of that place because she was too paralyzed to get out of that relationship, of that house, of, you know, she's, she'd been there since she was a teenager. She, she ran out of home at the age of 12. And this was like something out of her control that she thought she was going mad. And the fire, she had to get out of the house. And that's when she got out of that place. So she spoke about a lot of medication that she's been uh, since that time. Um, she was on antidepressants for 25 years. She she tried a lot of therapies. She's seen psychotherapists. And then she did not want to be off the medications, but they helped her cope. Sometimes she was so, so numb. She was completely in a zombie state. And then on the other hand, she would go on the top of the world, confident, on a high, as if she was going through an awakening. And then the way she coped was she would run. She said, I had so much energy in me, so much fire in me. I had to go and run. And then one day, suddenly she came off all medications. And as soon as she did that, she had really severe withdrawal symptoms. She said, my mind opened up to all the corruption in the world. She felt very lonely, very isolated, alienated, as if I don't belong to the world. I'm in a different world to everyone else, she thought. And she became quite obsessed with it. And then she became very vocal with her opinions, with her things she wanted to say. She became very obsessed with what she was eating. So from one hand, she went to the other extreme. And it's like a switch set me off. Started with this numbness, suppression. I can't speak. And this whole fuzziness she gets in the body intensifies. So on one hand, she's this suppressed, cannot speak, paralyzed state. On the other hand, she's very vocal. At this point, it's very important because there is such a lot of information and there are patients that we get, especially, you know, patients with a lot of anxiety, panic, they come up with a lot of overwhelm, confusion, and they basically just get that confusion out 
in that first call and give you all the information. And it's like this whole load of overwhelming, confusing information that you don't know what to do with, right? So at this point, you have to realize what stage is this information. You have to really step back and look at what stage is this information at. And if you see what's going on here, you will realize most of this information is at multiple stages, but mostly at stage one and two, which means there are so many diagnostic symptoms of anxiety and, you know, depression and paranoia and unstable moods. And then you have some information on the drugs she's been on for so long as well, and the withdrawal of those. And that's what we have here, right? So our task is cut out. We have to take this patient using strategies and clear questioning to go to stage three, okay? And stage three is where we find the connections, where we find what is peculiar about our patient within a diagnosis, within the, the information that they, they've given us. Not every patient can go here, but this patient, there is a great potential to go there. Why? Because she's so open, she's so expressive, she's so sensitive. She seems to be ready to go there. She wants to be helped in that way. And that is very critical. And that's the judgment you have to make as a practitioner. These are our typical classical patients that could do very well at stage three. It's your duty to be able to really take them to that stage. That is very important as a new practitioner that you understand how do you do that, yeah? So let's see what are the questions that my student was trained to ask in this patients and how do you use that questioning here? So the first question he asked her was describe the fuzziness. You know, this is one of the most interesting words she's used such a lot of time. There's this heaviness, there's this fuzzy buzzing in my entire body. And this is new. This is something you don't hear in every case. You have to ask that. And that's what he picked on, which was wonderful. So fuzziness is like a blockage in my chest, she says. I can't speak. I'm heavy. My ears are buzzing. They're vibrating. It's worse when I wake up in the morning. If triggered, it goes up a notch. I'm so sensitive to everything. I'm emotional. I'm overwhelmed. I'm crying all the time. I avoid cities because that is too intense for me as well, right? And parking is stressful. So I avoid people. I avoid any triggering news. Everything that they're saying is a lie and it stresses me out. So she shuts down. So when a patient is going on with this whole information about a chief complaint, it's very important to actually ask some key questions that get them into what we call as an uncompensated zone, right? So she's very compensated with this medication suppression and with her anxiety that it's important to find what are the things that she likes to do or hobbies and interests are one key place where you can actually ask them uh, and find the real them and find then find the connection with the chief complaint. So she says running. That's very interesting, right? She says, I like to run and it's my medicine. Then she does weights and yoga and then, you know, she brightens up because this is something deeper than just the chief complaint of her anxiety. She says, I get a buzz from running. She's using the same word now. I'm capable of something. I can get praise for something. I can put my music on and I get a lift from it. I feel so good. It lifts my spirit. I feel I've achieved something. I want to be someone. I want to be noticed. This is her. You know, frustrated, though I can't do it as much as I want because my stomach cramps up and in my lower abdomen and I'm crippled with pain. So when she runs a lot, she's crippled with pain, but yet she loves that running booze. And then he asks her, what's the opposite of that? Because this is what gives her um, the joy. We ask the opposite. We always get those two polarities in, in our patients. She says, the opposite is I'm down. There is no confidence. I'm helpless. I'm stuck. I don't have a life. It's like this panic. My mind spirals. Like my mouth is not moving to what I'm saying. I go very quiet. I go very suppressed. I'm, I'm very vulnerable. I can't speak up. My fire is gone. I'm alone. I'm not strong enough. The other place we go to understand her uncompensated state is her fear. So you ask about the fears. She says, I'm a bit obsessed with food and radiation and chemicals that go in the food. 
I always use natural products. Uh, I'm very obsessive about that. I don't know why. And then there is this fear of rats because if you can't even look at them, then she had panic at school when, when asked to read. So the patient draws back with hands on chest and eyes wide. This is a very important observation that the student does. And she says, I'm very confused. I'm just trying to find myself. The third place that you go to to find uncompensated state is the subconscious and the dreams. And it's a good sign if your patient has recurrent dreams that she had that they had as a child, which means that the state goes right until childhood. She's 52. So obviously the state has been going on for the last 40 years or more, right? So that is that tells us that this is one case where there is something that has been going on for so long, which means it is a linear case, more or less. And there is also a lot of, um, you know, and we can give the core remedy right at the start. She says, I had recurrent dreams that I'll be in my court and I'm falling down a spiral staircase and I wake up before I hit the bottom. It's absolute panic and dread. It's a sinking feeling. It's exactly the, the connection with her panic in real life and then she has dreams of losing teeth again she goes into a panic there and another dream she says I'm stuck in the back of a van but a child is driving it and there is intense fear there's no control I want to get out so this is her this is her going completely out of control thinking and in a panic which is exactly what happens in real life as well so these dreams are her core dreams and then she has some other dreams where she somebody was punching her mom and she starts screaming on waking up. What's the feeling in those dreams? It's awful. It's horrendous. She's screaming. It's like, you know, she's not been able to scream for long. It's like a suppression. Remember, she's been in that relationship which was abusive and she couldn't speak a lot. And now in this dream, she's expressing, screaming, but she can't. She says, somebody's on my chest, something's on my chest and suppressing it and I feel heavy and I cannot get it out. So this is again a very important dream and we'll come to that, but just be with her state. You can see that her dreams are absolutely what's reflecting her real life. And that was the detail and the depth that she could go to then we collected some past history from her, which is very important, and I'll tell you why later on, but it's important for understanding the myism. So the, she had a birth through emergency section, and then she has been hospitalized twice with an insect bite when she was in the Caribbean, and she was given morphine because she couldn't control it, the whole inflammation. And then she terminated her first pregnancy, and then she got pregnant again, and then she had you know her boy there is a family history on the mother's side we have diverticulitis lung fibrosis angina and rheumatoid arthritis her father had heart condition he's on a pacemaker probably something to do with the electrical conduction in the heart prostate cancer hernia and psoriasis her sister has psoriasis and arthritis a grand that's a mother grandmother has cancer and a grandfather had heart condition. So you can see there's a lot of heart issues, very, very strongly near syphilitic state there, autoimmune conditions, cancer, heart issues, loaded family history here, which is very important because this is where a patient is moving into. And this is what we need to stop with our homeopathy. This is, this is our work cut out here, right? And we'll discuss this more in detail when we look at the analysis, but important to understand what's going on, where she's leading towards. The car is going out of control. That's the state. And we need to stop and get her back on track. So this was the questions that my student had. It was confusing for him. He knew that it was going around to stage three and he was looking at using the Kenton approach. And then he says some language seems like plant-like and her general sensitivity seems to point towards Ignatia from his Metro medical knowledge. 
but then he thinks the language also seems like a mineral here and I'm looking at arsenic album as a remedy for her. So how do I prioritize what to do, where to go and how to prescribe here? That was the question, right? And that was the point when he submitted this case on the portal. Remember, a well-taken case is half the job done. The rest depends on how well you can analyze it. Okay, so that's your homework. I want you to go and analyze this case in your own way, in your own approach and create a totality, right? And then in part two of this, I'll be sharing the exact process of analysis, prescription and also tips to simplify this process for you, right? Now, if you are unsure what analysis is or what building a totality is, you might want to check out this video over here where I share how to analyze the case using the stages template. I talk about three strategies in there. One of them will work for you, okay? And by the way, I'm also running a free workshop on building a successful practice. Each February, I do that for my mentoring students. So if that's something for you, um, it's free. Come join us. Check the link below to find more information on that.